Will you pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Today's reading from Genesis, continuing the story of Abraham that we began last week, comes after the story of Noah and that covenant marked by a rainbow. As some of you know, Genesis is a compilation of several schools of writers that can be parsed apart by vocabulary and linguistics and occasionally a historical reference. Our text today is from the priestly writers who tell the story as a series of covenants. And each covenant is progressively narrower and it culminates in the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, a text that we will look at at the end of October. Noah's covenant and today's covenant with Abraham are made for all people. And rather than telling the history through public historical events like some L'Arc de Triomphe or a history book from our schools, the notes of significance are told through family stories with only an occasional reference to a king or a pharaoh. And while Yahwist writers look back to this early time of Abraham from the perspective of the glory years of King Solomon's time, the priestly writers who we look at today look back to this time of Abraham from the time of the Babylonian exile and terrible loss. Their own setting provides a lens that's real but quite different for their roots and the way of telling the story. So listen for the ways that the priestly writers insist that the covenant still holds and therefore people can dare to hope even as they live in a hopeless time. Listen for God's word as it comes to us from the 17th chapter of Genesis beginning at the first verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abram, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Be no matter what. Where have you heard that phrase? No matter what, don't touch the stove. It's hot. You'll get burned. No matter what, don't eat white berries in the wild, they are poisonous. No matter what, you cannot swim in the deep end until you pass your swim test. No matter what is at the core of this story. In that Hebrew word, barith, covenant. God willingly binds God's self to a people, a unilateral gift, a grant. 
God willingly binds himself to Abraham, but also to all his descendants. And it has timeless validity when we consider that Abraham has blood kin and faith kin descendants, more numerous than the stars in the sky, more numerous than the grains of sand on the seashore, as our young people reminded us today. The shocking reality is the fact that God willingly binds himself to a people who, like us, persist in turning away from grace. No matter what. Not all biblical covenants are this way. Some are enjoined on another party or in the covenant or else. Some are mutual. Some are really weighted with one party. Gerhard von Rott says, a covenant changes what is dangerous and unexplained into a salutary communal relationship by means of a legal ordinance which binds the members. There isn't necessarily parity in the arrangement. Often the more powerful instructs the weak. The verb here in Genesis 17 translates not as cut, but as given. A covenant given or established. Abraham is here really the dumb recipient of a promise, no matter what. And so are we really, aren't we? No matter what, God says, I will be your God. Just yesterday, I read a portion of Romans 8 from Mike Grimaldi's funeral that continues this no matter what covenant. Paul writes, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress and a whole laundry list of other situations? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ Jesus, love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. No matter what, God willingly binds himself to Abraham and descendants like you, even when we persist in turning away from grace, no matter what. But what and how does it matter? Well, God has given us an essence, really, just around us, not a stipulation. God is the initiator. The name change maybe gives us a clue. The man Abram was still the same person. The woman Sarai was still the same person. But when God changes their names to Abraham and Sarah, it marks a new stage where their identification is not what they accomplish like some superheroes, but that they are part of a divine purpose. Their fruitfulness is fulfilled against all odds by God with two willing, faithful followers. Here, each of Sarah and Abraham are brought into this no matter what covenant. And their relationship grows more fully under this covenant with God. This name changing has its presence with us still in our spiritual practice. In that sacrament of baptism where we hold that we are named and claimed by God in baptism. 
knowing this no matter what covenant God. Knowing no matter what covenant God puts us out to. We can choose a response. There are different pictures of it as we look at the text and how it gets translated. We are invited into divine reconciliation, we who keep turning away from that grace. There is always an open possibility to have a nurturing and right relationship with God. We can dare to walk toward God's promise with steady trust. We can respond with acts of obedience. We can walk before God with undivided loyalty. We can be available to God on God's own terms. Or as Deuteronomy 18.13 says, we can be whole with our God. What did it mean for Abraham and Sarah? If they chose to walk toward God's promise, then there was a possibility of a future from God that they could never derive for themselves. The verb for the promise of their offspring is the same as in Genesis 1, be fruitful. Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, which is huge in itself. And then there are two additional adjectives with it, be fruitful, fruitful and exceedingly. 90-year-olds could not do that on their own. When Abraham was, as Paul said, as good as dead, and Sarah, Genesis says, has been fruit barren through all her fertile years. God's covenant, should they walk toward it, held beneficence for future generations. It held friendship and solidarity, protection and resources for an open future. God's covenant cannot be disrupted even in the unknown, even in despair, even in the crisis of the deepest void. Hope is grounded in this covenant. Identity is grounded in this covenant. Abraham and Sarah's place in creation is grounded in this covenant. God raised new life out of a dead womb. This story today, with its promise of a son, is the third time that that promise has been uttered by God. It is 24 years later than the first time God uttered it to Abraham and Sarah. Abraham was 75 in that text that we read last week. How it all will happen, when it all will happen, it's not ours to direct. If we choose to live within this covenant, walking this way means being available to God and God's way. Which brings us to us. The essence of this covenant surrounds us and we are free to catch this covenant. Why would we want such an elusive, ancient thing for our lives? It doesn't earn a paycheck. It doesn't deliver chemo or immunotherapy. It doesn't make easy street. Here is where I find good news in this covenant. Every one of us has pieces of future that are as good as dead. Maybe it was a lifelong dream. Maybe it was how we thought we'd be happy. 
Maybe it involves a broken relationship. Every place that lines up with things like Paul saying he was good as dead, or Genesis saying Sarah who had no children, those are the hopeless places of despair where a way out seems impossible. We cannot work ourselves out of them. We cannot buy ourselves out of them. God binds himself to the likes of us. This God who brought creation out of nothing, this God who brought life to a dead womb, this God who brought life eternal out of death, this God who brings grace into every living hell. The covenant with this God persists no matter what. And there is a way forward when we dare to walk toward God's promise with steady trust, when we dare to be available to God on God's terms, when we can be whole with our God. It's for every person. And if we put ourselves in the shadow of this covenant, there is a beautiful hope that is ours. Doesn't mean easy street, but it is a way to walk in this amazing story that teems with life. Amen. <laughs>